You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Baum. Baum. I haven't seen you in a while. Uh, yeah, we took a couple weeks off. A little tough. It was good. Uh, I mean, not a recording. Yeah, because we were working hard. And sure. It's nice to take a little break. Sure. We did a couple pre-recordings, and now we're back. Absolutely. Yeah. And thank you for uh, making this podcast your choice right now in this moment. I, I really appreciate that, guys. It means... A ton, because there's a lot of choices out there. And uh, all I ask is, if you like the podcast today, which I hope you will, subscribe. And uh, here's our handles. If you want to follow us, write a review. Our handles are at Inside of You Podcast on the Instagram and uh, Facebook and Twitter, at Inside of You Pod. It's all right here. You can see it visually if you want. You can watch on YouTube. It's fun. Come and enjoy our clips. We've got tons of great clips. Tons of great episodes if you if you want to look back. And uh, that's really all I have. Our, our guest today, by the way, I'm I'm turning fifty shortly. You got a couple months. I don't have that long. You know, I, I'm, I'm thinning a little bit on the top, just a hair, just mm-hmm. my, my hairdresser. So Your hair that. is thinning a hair. But hey, it's life. You know, this is fifty, and uh, you know, I, I've had my hair for quite a long time, and it's still good. But you know, at fifty years old, you, you, you things shit happens. Yeah. These so are, these are the things that happen at this age so you take care of it now yeah you take care of it yeah you do the work yeah uh kate siegel is on the podcast you know her from uh haunting of hill house midnight mass she's been in so many movies so much great stuff uh her partner mike flanagan who's directed a lot of stuff uh they they collaborate together they write together they uh she's a she's a force to be reckoned with man I, i loved having her and i think she's truly truly talented and uh, I'm glad she sat down with me. Thank you, Miss Siegel. And uh, hey, if you want to go to the uh, Inside of You store, go to the Inside of You online store. There's some great merch there and some autograph stuff and new tumblers. And then uh, the Patreon. Thank you, my patrons. Patrons give back, Ryan. What do they do? They uh, keep the podcast going. They do. They they they, can... give, they donate. They, they, they just are so helpful. Go to yeah. Patreon. Patreon, P A T R E O N dot com slash inside of you. Join today. I'll send you a message. There's different tiers. It's a lot of fun. In fact, at the end of the episode, I read the top tiers' names out. And we do it every uh, every episode. Ryan has memorized most of the names. And uh, so check that out. Uh, I'll be at some conventions coming up. St. Louis, Missouri, May 13th. We're doing a, fr- a Smallville Nights in St. Louis. I love it. Tom Welling and I will be there for Smallville Nights, and we'll also uh, be there Saturday and Sunday signing autographs. Then we'll be in Liverpool in late May. Uh, so join us, and uh, yeah, come say hi. And uh, without further ado, Ryan, why don't we just get right into Kate Siegel. It's my point of view. You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Inside of you with Michael Rosenbaum was not recorded in front of a live studio audience. Yeah, what are you what are you drinking there? What is that? This is um, it's called Boreal Botanical. This is not an ad. Um, it's like a little, um, it's like reishi mushroom botanical tonic it has elderberry and birch. <laughs> this is why I never booked any commercials ever in my whole life. I was like, oh, this thing is a thing wait a minute wait a minute you've never booked a commercial in your life um i had one of those amazing uh commercial actor things where i had a commercial agent first i auditioned for commercials for 10 years two or three times a week and i booked one commercial one pharmacy oh maybe two a pharmaceutical commercial and a tide commercial where i had stinky pants you had stinky pants in a commercial and a pharmaceutical commercial. Where I had a rash, where I had eczema or psoriasis. Are you serious? Those are the only two th- commercials I ever booked. I I've never imagine. booked a commercial. I only voiceover. They wouldn't even want to see my face on the commercial. It's a, a commercial world. Is, let me turn my phone off. My commercial world is beyond me. I know people who make a living out of it and who... Love it, and it's their world. I found those auditions unbearable, and I think that probably read on my face. You know what I think it is? I think that you're just such a wonderful actor, you know, that they just, you know, they were like, you know, she's just too good for this world. 
You think so? But then I remember, like, I always think I'm real cute, even when I'm not. And I was auditioning for a birth control commercial or oh, something. Great. And they were like, what's your favorite things about babies? And, you know, any normal commercial actor in the world would have been like, their smell, their softness. And because I'm an asshole and I can't help myself, I said, their tender meat. Their tender meat. Mm-hmm. Wow. No one thought it was funny. <laughs> it landed like a lead balloon. And they were like, thanks so much. And then I never saw that casting office again. Wow. That's amazing. That world, it seems so long ago that I auditioned for commercials and I'd go in there. And I had these fangs. Like my, my teeth are straight now. But I used to have these little fangs. And I would never book anything. And I was like, why am I not booking anything? And Did I, you get the veneers? Is that what well, I yeah, I remember a manager of mine once. Uh, his name's Dave Becky. And he like he, he repped me. At the time, Dave Chappelle, Mark Marin, like all these guys who are huge now. I was like the only actor and then all these stand-up comedians. Um, what's the other guy's name? The guy who goes, rice is a great snack if you're in the mood for 2,000 of something. What was that guy's name? Oh, <laughs> Mitch Hedberg. <laughs> Mitch Hedberg. Yeah. Yeah. Mitch Hedberg. Mitch Hedberg. And I remember oh, I remember Dave comes up to me and goes, hey, man, um, I, I think you need to get your teeth fixed. And I go, really? What about Steve Buscemi? He's like, yeah, but I don't think you're that much of a character actor. I think, you know, if you, I think if you just straighten your teeth out, get a retainer or whatever, yeah. I think it will change your, your career. And he was right. Yeah. I straightened my I fucking it. teeth and I started booking like lead roles. I mean, here's a hot take on this podcast that I've never said anywhere else. Same. You fixed your teeth too? Oh yeah. These aren't my teeth. Your teeth are good. They're sp- you can get a commercial now if you wanted. Now I can. I had like little tiny baby teeth. Dear internet, please go unearth those photos. Because I did. I worked for a while, but not well and not often with my tiny teeth and gummy smile. And I had the same thing. I had a producer say to me, well, she said two things. She said, fix your teeth and pin your ears back. Get your ears pinned. What? And I was like. Mm, I had a little self-esteem, not a lot of self-esteem. So I had enough self-esteem to be like, no, I'm not pinning my ears. But then I got my teeth fixed. Yeah. But they, so people, you can actually have your ears pinned. I'll show you. I have normal human ears. Yeah. They look like very good ears. But what they'll do is they'll put like a little stitch that way. So that like front on, you have no human ears. Apparently ears are a no, no in the film. world. Were you considering it? Be honest. Were you considering? Oh, yeah, I was considering. I would have done anything. I wanted to be an actor so badly. It's all I wanted to do. It was just like for so many years, the goal was just let it be a full-time job. Please, God, let it just be enough to pay rent. And I would have pinned my ears. I would have fixed my, I didn't have, like, again, this is not good advice because I didn't have boundaries or self-esteem. I had a cloud of desperation. That's what I had. Right. And an unrelenting ambition. I like how honest you are about loving acting and like I would do anything to be an actor. And a lot of people would go like, you know, they wouldn't. But you really took it seriously. You really wanted to do every. Did you take tons of classes? Yeah. And really, you took like everything you need to do. The best headshot guy, the best acting oh, coach. Right. I was so confused because like I got my degree. I got in class. I did everything. I was did all the right things. I tried every headshot and it was and I want to be honest about this because I'll make fun of literally anything. But I think people who care about stuff, that's not it's not funny to mock that. It's not funny when somebody wants something and they go, go after it and they fail. You don't tease that. But so I, it was like 10 years. It was 10 years of like, maybe it's my headshots. Maybe it's my reel. Maybe I need another class. Maybe if I cut my hair, maybe if I grow my hair, maybe if I fix my teeth, maybe if I, and just like, just running from door to door, banging and banging and banging and banging because there was never really any other option for me. Wow. I tried other things. I tried to do other things and I was miserable. Well, you know what's crazy? I feel like I know you. First of all, one of my good friends is Robert Longstreet, who, yeah, I know. See, you love him. Who doesn't love him? You were in, you know, Midnight Mass together. You were in oh, Haunting of Hill House. Me. Yeah, he's such a great. I've known him since like the 90s. And um, he just talks so highly of you. And then I'm going to interview on Monday Rahul Kohli. Is it that I, best friends. See? I mean, isn't this funny? It's such yeah. a small world. 
It is. And I think within that small world, there's a smaller world of people who aren't assholes. And like, we can see each other across the room. And you know that because when you like people make fun of name droppers, but when you say to me, I'm friends with Robert Longstreet, I know you're a good guy. <laughs> Because Robert Longstreet isn't friends with assholes. He's not. And yeah. if they are assholes, they're funny and charming and worth it. Yeah. Rob's a, lo- he's a bit of a loner, does his own yeah. thing. He does, goes his own way. Mm-hmm. And I've always loved that about him. But he's, but honestly, I have to say this and we won't get on because people are like, who's Robert Longstreet? Well, look up Robert Longstreet. Yeah. Watch him in F- some you, of these you movies. You don't know who Robert Longstreet is. He's fantastic. But like the guy, I really believe Rob is a genius. I do believe yes. he's a genius. Yeah. Yeah, he baffles me. Some of the things he says, I'm just like, how did that come out of someone's mouth? How do you come up with that shit? It's crazy. It's crazy. So how did it all start for you? Because, I mean, look look at all the stuff you've done. And I'm a huge, huge horror fan. Huge. I interviewed your husband, Mike Flanagan, who I think is one of the most gifted directors, writers out there. And I just... I felt like a kid in the candy store when I'm, I'm, you know, t- when I was talking to him because I'm just such a, you know, I have an affinity for horror movies, but you've been in like all these horror movies that, uh, or shows, a Haunting of Hill House and and Hush, which you 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 co-wrote with Mike and Midnight Mass and Oculus and the, the Fall of the House of Usher's coming out and Ouija and Gerald's Game and it's like oh I'm like holy shit you are really you won the lottery when it comes to this for horror fans you're in all these. Do you do you love being called a screen queen or is it something you're like, I'm not a screen love queen? It. You love it. Love you it. embrace it. Sure, why not? Ride the horse in front of you. What am I gonna look down on the people who got me where I am? No. And it's also for actors, this is the top of everything. Because you're not just like walking into a hospital operating room and going 10 cc's of saline with like a calm face for 14 years you're like holy shit my boyfriend's on fire there are fucking vampires i'm falling in love i'm falling out of love i'm running through the woods i'm covered in blood like for people who love acting horror genre is where it's at because like every single one of those shows you mentioned all of those characters are stretched to their breaking points and then they break and if you don't want to play on the biggest jungle gym like why are you at the park you know, it's funny, though, is when I watch these, I feel like you're right, too, and they're the hardest to do. You, I mean, you, you can see what an actress like you are. Like, when you watch your performances, you just give it all you've got, and it's just so believable. And I really love that because there's nothing worse than seeing a horror movie with bad actors or right. terrible writing or whatever. But when you see someone committing and just invested and just in that role, it just – it's awesome. And I feel like I watch you, and I'm like – I don't look at you and go, she's a screen queen. I feel like this, she, she could be nominated for an Academy Award. That's how good I think you are. Jesus Christ. I do. Yeah. I really believe you're great. I told Mike, I was like, Mike, can you, can you get me an interview with her? She's like, he's like, well, I have, you know, I have a little inside, you know. I'm, Just I'm, a little bit. I'm her husband. No, he loved you too. And he was like, you're going to have so much fun, Kate. And this actually is perfect timing because I was shooting yesterday and I felt so insecure after the scene and I bet you can relate to this I and this is I swear to god I'm not joking I hid in the closet in my trailer after the scene because I was like this is the one where they're all gonna find out I'm a fraud where it's just not gonna work and because acting when you're doing these extreme circumstances like that right where there's no there's no YouTube video for my boyfriend is on fire in front of me. It doesn't, I can't go watch people go through that and then recreate it. It's it's what we call an inactable circumstance. So basically anything you do, you can make sense of. And in the horror genre, when you get to those moments or things where there is no touchstone for, you must trust your director and your DP implicitly because they're the ones who are going, yes, that's real. I believed it. I believe you. Even as a person you can feel like a fraud because you really are faking it because there, I can't generate in me a feeling of being eaten alive by a vampire. Like I don't have that. So when it's so, it, it, it demands everything. It takes everything that I have that I've built and like all of my stability. And when it's done, I feel like I just 
walked into a room naked and farted. Like I feel ashamed. <laughs> I feel embarrassed. Like I don't feel cute. I don't feel sexy. I don't feel all the things. I don't feel like me. I don't feel like them. And, and I'm so that like at the end of it, I need to be alone in a tiny dark space. And that's, I think why actors need, or why I need the validation I need because I have to get out of the closet. <laughs> like literally I'm not in the closet anymore for a lot of things, but like, I have to oh, get I want out to hear of about closet. that. Yeah. I have to get out of the closet literally and hearing from audience members that you believe me and it affects you truly keeps me going. I wish I was a, a less intense person. I wish I was cool. You know, do you well, ever wish you were cool? I, I believe me. I've always wished I was cool. I never, I never have felt comfortable. I've talked about this a million times, but when I'm around other like celebrities or bigger celebrities, I feel like, what am I doing here? I don't belong here. I, 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 I I'm never comfortable. I could yeah, fake never, it. I could fake it, but I'm never comfortable. I'm never comfortable. Even on set, I'm supposed to show this confidence, and I'm showing it. I'm showing it, and sometimes I am eating my own ass. I am so nervous. I'm so <laughs> insecure. I'm like, I suck. I, oh yeah. my God, I'm embarrassed. Like I'm, I feel like I'm blushing. Sometimes one time a director said to me, he's like, oh, that was so cool. And that last take, I could see your face. You like, you blushed. And I'm like, that's because I was nervous. And I thought I was really fucking up and I was embarrassed in my head. Yeah. Yeah. It but was this crazy. Is the secret. This is what I want to tell like little baby actors who are <laughs> trying to be cool or trying to be successful. Um, there is a you that radiates that like your story is exactly perfect. You we're in the moment terrified and it made you blush. And that was a brilliant choice. I believe that's the secret of all actors. That's what they mean when they say, get out of your way, right? People say that to actors all the time in class. You're in your own way. You're standing in your own way. Yeah. What that means is you're trying to cover up your authentic experience in the scene, even if it doesn't match what you're doing on the page. So if you're doing a, a scene in the dead of winter in Antarctica, and you're on set on stages in August in Atlanta and you're wearing a heavy coat and it's like fake snow is falling on you. And you as an actor, as a person are so hot and embarrassed. I would say, take off your fucking coat and be like, I'm so hot. And then later the audience is going to be like, that's the most genius choice I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it is, it's about really, it's about, just revealing your underpants every fucking day. I going it. for it. Going it. for it. Yeah. I mean, look, when you say you curled up in a closet after you did, and this is for the uh, the fall of the House of Usher, right? This is what you're yeah, filming right now? Yeah, this show is bombastic as fuck. When it's you, just like insane. It's that intense. It's jallo, which I didn't know what that word meant until this show. What's the word? Couch. What's the word? Jallo. G-A-L-L-O. It's a type of filmmaking that's like Suspiria. So it's ah. like extreme lights and sets and people it's Poe. it's like gothic crazy insanity it's chaotic evil and can't hold back there's none of that midnight mass grounded realism seven minute monologue thing it's just like buckets of blood and people acting in a letter that i mean that it just it's so it, it terrifies me like i watch you know mike's films or at least the last couple of shows that he did like uh the haunting of hill house and midnight mass and i'm watching some of these scenes and i'm going i don't think i could do this oh my god he's staying on this fucking actor he doesn't take how is she <laughs> she's oh my god he's been on her for five minutes she's still talking when is it when are they gonna cut away why what are they doing I can't, i'm getting nervous for the actor i'm like how the fuck and, and i'll tell you what the preacher in that show how did he how do they have enough footage to film his scenes? Because he had like 10 pages straight of monologue. I could oh, never, he's ever he's do a it. Genius. He's a genius. Could you have done that? What Hamish did? No, it's not possible. Hamish is a genius, like touched by God genius. Like I, no. Because also, fun fact behind the scenes, like Hamish wasn't, offered that part like he wasn't the first choice there was a different look that they were going for and Hamish was I believe a fan or somehow got a hold of the script and was like I want to read for this and I had been a fan of Hamish's for years like all the way back to some of his theater work he did a Hamlet that I thought was like life-stopping and I 
begged Annie McCarthy, the casting director, and like, can I just be his reader? I promise, like, I'll wear glasses and a mustache. Like, I just want to see the man work. And the second he opened his mouth, there was no other choice ever. What he did was blew every other concept of Father Paul out of the water. It was brilliant from the first day. Did he ever mess up his lines? Because I'm watching this going, I'm not kidding. Listen, listeners, if you're bored, tough shit. Because this is as an actor, anyway, you're watching these, these moments and you're saying to yourself, he's saying these lines 15 minutes straight without someone else talking. The camera is always on him. It is, it's almost like an impossibility to think you can memorize that much material. I don't know he how did. people do it. You, you do it. You do I it with a lot of stuff. I mean, it's just, I think it's similar to any other muscle. I, 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 I'm not shy about it. I print out the pages and I go for a walk and I get my body moving and I just, takes about 20 minutes a page and that's it. 20 minutes a page and you have it memorized. Yeah. You realize that's a gift though. That's like, you must have a, a photographic memory or something. No, it's a skill. It's a skill. I practice it all the time. If I stopped it, it wouldn't work. I, I don't think it, well, I, I truly don't believe what I do is magic. I believe it is bravery, a little bit of psychosis, and practice. Inside of You is brought to you by Wondery, even the rich, Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Monroe, she is far and away the most famous actress of the 20th century. Her name and image are synonymous with the American ingenue, and in an all-new season of Wondery's Even the Rich, Hosts Brooke and Arisha pull back the curtain on her legendary life and career. Much has been said and written about Marilyn in the 60 years since her tragic death at 36, but what often gets overshadowed is the absolute force of nature she was while she was alive. Marilyn was a woman ahead of her time in so many ways. From the moment she stepped onto her first movie set, it became clear that it was her acting an intoxicating charm that brought her film's box office success. But her rising stardom threatened movie studio execs who wanted starlets they could control. From major studios holding her to unjust contracts to studio execs making sexual advances, Marilyn privately endured all the worst parts of Hollywood sexism, and overcoming those barriers often forced her to choose between her dreams and her sanity. That inimitable Marilyn magic, it wasn't an accident. She created it and became the biggest movie star in the world despite being underestimated and ridiculed at every turn. Even the Rich has all the juicy details on her spectacular but all too short life. I, I When you walk in my house, you see a giant Marilyn picture that I just love. It's so engaging. She was so engaging. There was something about her that you just, you were so drawn to, you couldn't take your eyes off of her. And uh, the magnetism, man, magnetism. And her life is so interesting and it was so tragic. And it's like that she's always interesting. Anytime there's anything on TV or I have to hear it or I have to see it because that's who she was. It's just like you want to know more and more about someone who lived such a short life. And she was a complex character. Listen to Even the Rich, Marilyn Monroe on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or you can listen ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. Inside of you is brought to you by Nutrafol. Well, it's finally happening. Uh, you know, Ryan, um, I went to the hairstylist, Nathan, and Nathan said, oh, you have a little spot here that's, you're, you're thinning just in that little area, so you might want to get something. Mm -hmm. And that was yesterday. Oh, no. And today I'm reading about Nutrafol. Oh, no. How coincidence? Coincidence? I think not. 80 million men and women in the U.S. experience thinning hair. I'm not alone, Rye. I'm not. <gasps> yes, it's still not openly talked about, but it should be because I talk about it openly. I don't give a crap. This is called life, folks. Uh, and it can make you know going through what you're going through a little more stressful. And that just adds to the problem. Stress adds to the problem. So look, millions of Americans experience thinning hair. It's more than common. It's normal. Um, Nutrafol is the number one dermatologist recommended hair growth supplement clinically shown to improve your hair growth, thickness, and visible scalp coverage for men and women. Did you know that there are multiple causes of thinning hair? Nutrafol is the hair growth supplement that goes beyond genetics to target stress, hormones, nutrition, metabolism, aging, and lifestyle factors that may be impacting your hair. Thinning is different for men and women. Nutrafol has multiple unique formulas for men and women to provide exactly what they need based on their biology and age. 
Every formula is physician formulated using natural medical grade ingredients for reliable results without compromises. In clinical studies, 72% of men saw more scalp coverage and 86% of women saw improved hair growth after six months. Nutrafol is also trusted and recommended by more than 3,000 top doctors. You can grow thicker, healthier hair and support our show by going to Nutrafol.com and entering the promo code INSIDE to save $15 off your first month's subscription. This is their best offer anywhere, and it's only available to U.S. customers for a limited time. Plus, free shipping on every order. Get $15 off at Nutrafol.com, spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L.com, promo code INSIDE. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Inside of you is brought to you by Helix Sleep. We've talked about this. And guys, you know, with my back and all my back surgeries and my neck surgeries and, you know, Ryan's getting old. The, the one, the <laughs> one right. you know, you, you just had a birthday. I did. You just had a birthday. You're 34 Four. years old. Uh-huh. Ryan, I don't care how old you are, but the older you get, the more you realize how important a very comfortable mattress is. This is what you do most. You spend most of your time on your mattress sleeping. It's crazy, but that's what we do. So you have to have something that's really comfortable. Well, Helix Sleep has designed something that I think you guys will love. Um, Helix Sleep has a quiz that takes just two minutes. Even I can pass it. So it's two minutes to complete. Matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. I mean, why would you buy a mattress made for someone else? With Helix, you're getting a mattress that you know will be perfect for the way you sleep. And everybody's unique. And Helix knows that. So they have several different mattress models to choose from. Soft, medium, and firm mattresses. Mattress is great for cooling you down if you sleep hot. And even a Helix mattress for plus-size sleepers. Uh, I took the quiz and uh, medium. It's like the porridge we talk about. It's like right right in the middle. I don't want it to be too hard or too soft. I like it right Mm -hmm. in the freaking middle. So if you're looking for a mattress, just take this short quiz, order the mattress that you're matched to, and the mattress comes right to your door, shipped for free. You don't ever need to go to a mattress store again. Just go to helixsleep.com slash inside. Take their two-minute quiz, and they'll match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life and a 10-year warranty. You get to try it out for 100 nights risk-free. They even pick it up for you if you don't love it, but you will. Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash inside. That's helixsleep, H-E-L-I-X, sleep.com slash inside for up to $200 off and two free pillows. Why did you go into your trailer? Why did you, (laughs) you went into the, to the closet because you really thought that you were awful and that they're going to figure you out, that you're not a great actress because of this one moment. Now, does Mike, as a director, do, does does the director, does he come to you and say, no, seriously, Kate, I wouldn't lie to you. I'm your husband. <laughs> Honestly, everybody, all of my friends are on set and they're like, that was amazing. You crushed it. And I'm like nodding politely because it is not appropriate to scatter your shit around set. Right. It's not appropriate to waste everyone's time. Like, I'm so insecure. Please feed me, love me, love me, feed me. <laughs> um, that's not professional. So you kind of go, thank you so much. That was amazing. And Mike will say, are you happy? Or Mike Fiminari actually was directing this episode. And he goes, I'm happy. Are you happy? And I go, if you're happy, I'm happy. And I just fucking shut it down until I get in my trailer. And then like, I don't know, I'll call my sponsor or I'll call, (laughs) I'll text my therapist and make them talk to me for a while because that is the difference, right? That to me is the way you have to do it because that set needs to keep moving. My husband cannot stop and rebuild my confidence between every setup. Like that's a terrible way to run a show. So you, it's not their business how I feel about it. And like then that night I went out to dinner with Sam Sloyan and Rahul and I was like, you guys, I just am going to throw myself. You're like, you do it off time. You find who you can talk to. That's a lesson I learned in my career. That like said, it's just not the place for your shit. And right. if I really messed up, Mike will help me that night and be like, no, you were great. I was there. It's okay. Come here. I'll hold you. Because I'm, you know, I'm like a lonely little kitten. Do you ever get in arguments because it's like you have to stop, you have to let it go because you're the actor and we all have insecurities and all these things that we're talking about. But are there ever moments where like, Kate, shut the fuck up. Mike, I can't let it go. (laughs) 
Yeah, sure. I mean, I think it's, it's more less an argument and more like an exasperation. But I'll say this for Mike Flanagan, and he's a genius, and he's like the, one of the greatest creators of our generation. He loves me for who I am. And so he's not trying to change that. You're not going to yell at someone out of insecurity, right? They're not going to change their insecurity because you yelled at them enough. <laughs> right, right, right. And if he didn't want, and, and he wanted me, and part of me is that I love the work so much. It means so much to me. I think of it as a spiritual thing. Like I love my job so much that I always feel like I'm not serving it enough. Yeah. I think he understands that. Like, I think as creators, we understand that. Do you recognize when you're good, when you nail it, when you are like, I am fucking gold on that take. I don't need any more. Why are we going again? Every so often. Yeah. That's a good feeling though, isn't it? It's the best. You just have that confidence, right? You have that confidence that you just feel like it fills up the room. It's like, fuck, okay, this is why I'm here. Yeah, because all those, yeah. you can see. Yeah, you feel the energy rise. You feel like the crew lean forward a little bit. You feel your scene partners like perk up because they want to play too. Yeah, that's a good day. I've had moments where you know I'm on set where I just like I could tell the, the crew's looking at me like he's fucking good. And then yeah. I've had days where I'm like, man, what? Like the, I'm thinking, I'm thinking what they're thinking, and they're like, yeah, what's wrong with Rosenbaum today? He just doesn't have it. They're never thinking that. They're oh, thinking, yeah. Like, are we getting a meal penalty today? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Did you always want to do this since you were a kid? Yeah. Since you grew, you grew up in Maryland? Yeah. And like, yeah. how do you have brothers and sisters? I have an older sister. She is a lawyer for the government in the Department of Education. Wow. Like, um, my dad was a lawyer and an um, international banker thing. And my mom was an elementary school principal. And I had no connections, like not, zero connections to this world at all. And they were all expecting me to be a teacher or a lawyer. That was the thing, a long line of teachers and lawyers. And I was like, nope. How old when you when you thought, what was it about acting? What was it, what, what did you do? You had to perform in something that gave you that little yeah. feeling. Um, my sister used to write plays and I would perform in them with our friends. We always did it from a very young age, make believe and all this stuff. I didn't know it was a career. I didn't know it was a job until I was in one of those, like, gosh, I must've been first grade, maybe earlier. I was in one of those like camp summer camps where you do a lot of different things. It was just like a general like community center camp. And one of the things was a play and it was a little tiny performance to do for the parents at the end of it, just like singing and whatever. And the counselor, the camp counselor who did that part of it, called my mom in the fall and said, I am doing the Days of Wine and Roses at Community College. I'm directing it at like Montgomery County Community College. I need a little girl for one scene to just run on and say, I love you, daddy, or whatever happens. Can Katie do it? And my mom was like, yeah, that works. That's okay. And I did that and I looked around and I was like, holy balls, you <laughs> could do this forever. And that was it. And then I was done. That was it. Your one line on stage, that yeah. one moment or whatever it was, that was yeah. enough to give you that feeling like this is what I have to do. I think it was less the being on stage and more the community around it. The way all the actors laughed and how the women were glamorous, but also like powerful and how like everybody was quick and funny and everything was exciting and everybody loved and supported each other and joked around and the, we rode the roller coaster together and it didn't hurt at all that I was like this tiny little six-year-old there that everyone probably doted on and was like a little actress. <laughs> and I was so enamored by the sense of community and belonging that I wanted it forever. Did, you said Katie. Now, who do you allow people, what people do you allow to call you Katie? Um, so there are two types of people who call me Katie. <laughs> people who knew me when I was young and people in my life who come to it organically. Like every once in a while, like it's not like at some point in a friendship I say, and now you may call me Katie. Right. Like some of my best friends still call me Kate. But just the other day, um, 
one of the props girls walked up to me and said, Hey, Katie, do you want to use this phone? And I just loved it. It just worked with her right. and me and it was right. It might've been because she thought I was Katie Parker, but it also <laughs> might've been <laughs> that she said it and it just felt right. I never really correct anyone because most people go with Kate. But your husband calls you Kate. Mike calls you Kate. Yeah, no, he, <laughs> he no, I'm thinking, you know, he calls me honey. He calls me cute. He calls me. Um, a lot of things. I guess he calls me Kate. Yeah. When he uses a name, he uses Kate. So after this show, this, you did this little play, what was next? And were your parents sort of like, uh, not allowing it, but sort of entertaining it and saying, this is what she likes to do. Let's let her do this. Or what was their attitude towards that? And what was the next thing that kind of that you did? So in that sense, because they didn't have any connection to this world, like, it would have never occurred to them to let me be a child actor. So I did school theater. I would do any summer camp I did was theater based. Anytime I went to sleepaway camp, I would want to do the play, but it was never a professional job. I went to um, this big high school outside of DC before I transferred to private school. And they did like a modeling agent scout there. And when I was 15, this woman called my mom and was like, Hey, we want to bring Kate to New York to do some, test shoots and model. And my mom was like, over my dead fucking body. And I was horrified, humiliated, locked myself in my room, hated her for years. <laughs> and now I'm like, thank you. Yes. That could have just, uh, that, that it's never good. It probably is never, yeah. seldom is it good. It's never, it wouldn't have turned out well. So she it kept, she me kept me you there. She kept you there. So. Kept me there, kept me there, kept me there. And then when I went, to college, they allowed me to major in theater as long as I went to a school that had other things. So like I couldn't have applied to Juilliard or CalArts. I ended up going to Syracuse because it was a liberal arts school with a great theater program. And um, everyone thought that this would become, because this is a, like where I grew up, it wasn't a thing where people became actors, and professional actors and actresses. So they thought it would become, I'd become a theater teacher who does community <laughs> theater or I was like going to be, maybe I would produce theater. Right. They never think that your kid's going to become a star or an, a working actor. They never, no one ever actor. thinks that. No, no, they really didn't think it. Like I love them, but they really didn't think it. Right. And so um, there's a second catalyst that happened, which was right before my senior year of college, my dad died really suddenly. He had a heart attack while he was playing tennis, dead before he hit the ground. And oh. we don't really, I mean, anybody can imagine that's fucking, it was a week after my 21st birthday. Like your whole life is gone. Oh, man. And he, we were a close family. He was a huge part of my life. And then I like said goodnight to him one night thinking I'd see him forever. And he was just fucking gone. And there was no rhyme or reason. There was no health issues. You never knew no, that he had any heart complications. Nothing. Just gone. Just gone. Oh. No. And he was like 56. Holy shit. It was so unbelievably traumatic that even to this day, as I approach 40 myself, I am still unpacking it and how, how my life was... Uh, um, it was how my life was built around it, the scar tissue of that. And so in that moment, instead of doing what I planned to do, which was move to New York when I graduated, I finished my senior year and I moved back to DC and my dad worked at the World Bank. That was his job when he died. And the World Bank, for some unknown reason to me, offered me an internship which is like the gold ring of international finance internships, but I was a theater major. Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it didn't make any sense. Right. Um, and I sat there for the summer and I kind of, I just put my headshot and resume into an envelope because I saw the Folger Theater was casting a show that needed girls in their twenties. And I started doing Shakespeare in DC and I thought, you know what, this would be great. I'll be a Shakespeare actor in DC. Won't make any money, but like, well, how nice. And then I got cast in a play. And after the table read, I was fired for being bad. For, bad. Be for being bad? Oh, I was bad at the table read. And they were like, she can't do this. 
So they you replaced were, me. That was the first time you ever were fired or let go of something, right? Mm-hmm. How did that no, feel? I, mean, I was rejected constantly. I was not very good for a long time. Really? Yeah. I mean, we all get better. We all learn. We all like if you study and you do this. But do you think you had natural ability or do you think that you just really had to work hard to be as good as you are? Um, I think I came into the game a solid B. A B? Yeah. A B? What the hell's wrong with a B? Yeah, but a B is a guest star twice a year on various shows, right? You're not making a living at a B. If you want to be a series regular, if you want to be a part of the conversation, you've got to be in, this is the fucking Olympics. You got to be an A. I don't know. I see a lot of B minuses, C pluses, C minuses. I'll go even to D's on some TV. There's a lot of TV. There's a lot of great TV. There's also a lot of bad TV and there are a lot of grades. Maybe the grades are, I don't know. What I'm saying is a B is pretty good and you you could be a working actor with a B. So you were, you were good. You weren't bad, but you had a lot to do. You had a lot more to to learn. Right. Yeah, so I got fired, and because of this traumatic event, like my dad's, this is like a year. We're oh. still within the year or two after he died. I thought to myself, if this world is going to shit on me, I'm not getting shit on in Washington fucking D.C. <laughs> I'm going to get shit on in New York or L.A. And I flipped a coin, and it was L.A. Just like that. And what did you? The world was like, oh, you want to get shit on? Here's ten years of shit. That's for sure. There you go. You want to? You really be shit on? Here's how you get shit on. I got exactly what I asked for. (laughs) Now this is you moved out to LA. How long after your father passed away? Um, three or four years. Right, and maybe less. Yeah. Did your Did your mom remarry or? Oh yeah. She did. Yeah. Right away. I'm nodding for those people who can't see me. Yes. So that's. I learned to love him. I grew to love him very much. But it wasn't easy in the beginning. No, it was six months after my dad had died. There was a new man sitting at the breakfast table. <sighs> man, did you lash out or what? Oh, constantly. What did you do? How dramatic? Give me a dramatic moment that oh, you this remember. Is so I come home. So my dad dies in August. The first time, Gordon, Gordon Pavey was his name. He died of cancer. He is a fantastic person and did not deserve this. And to his credit, he was perfect. He was like a horse whisperer. He waited calmly, waited me out, didn't respond, didn't put himself in any awkward situations. Gordon was a great man. Um, I was not prepared for this. So my dad died in August. So by the time I came home for spring break, my mom and Gordon were dating, like significantly. And Gordon was staying over at the house. It's so weird because my mom is married to a Gordon. My stepdad is Gordon. Do you like Gordon? I like Gordon. Gordon's like king of the hill, Gordon. Gordon's like, your mother has long haul COVID. (laughs) Everything sounds like he's pissed off about it. He's like, your mother tried to call you yesterday. It's like king of the fucking hill. I love Gordon. Oh, my God. But go ahead. Tell me about your Gordon and what you did. I want to hear this. Um, My Gordon was a Harley Davidson driving whiskey drinking Ohio native, but also like worked at the ACLU for union rights, like just a great guy. Um, so anyway, Gordon, my mom says to me, calls me at Syracuse and it's like, you're coming home for spring break. Gordon will be staying over. Step one, utter screaming meltdown on the phone. How dare you? What do you mean? He's going to, you can't do this to me. Dad's just died. I have my mom, to her credit, like my mom is going to live her life the way she wants to. And she was like, no, this is how it's going to be. <sighs> I'm on the phone with my sister. Joe, I'm going to burn him to the ground. I'm going to actually murder him. And my sister, who's <laughs> used to her very traumatic younger sister, was like, sure, whatever. You need an alibi. I'll help you murder him. And and I'm going to help you because I'm going to be a lawyer. So this is great. Exactly. <laughs> so I get home and I get home late one night and I go to bed and... I come downstairs and Gordon is sitting where my dad used to sit at the breakfast table. This is the first time I meet Gordon. And all I have in that memory is like TV static and the music from Kill Bill. (laughs) And I know I screamed a lot. Like it is a legend in my family that I was like, get out of his fucking chair, you opportunistic fuck. 
Like I was not holding, I was in theater school. Like I was smoking and wearing black. I was very dramatic at the time. I did a lot of drugs. <laughs> and you really said get off the chair, you fuck? I think I said opportunistic fuck. Opportunistic fuck. Yeah. Did he say a word? And I'm sure he was like, you can't speak to me like that. Gordon wasn't a pushover. But like, I think the whole room knew what was going on. Like nobody was like, Kate's okay. And she's just kind of a bad person. (laughs) But yeah, and it was like that for years. I remember Gordon didn't like to eat bacon. He like wasn't a vegetarian or anything. He just didn't like bacon. And my sister and I would just mail him bacon all the time. <laughs> it was like the parent trap, but I was an adult and I was supposed to know better. <laughs> Inside of You is brought to you by BetterHelp. BetterHelp Online Therapy. I can't tell you how many emails or texts or messages I get from people telling me that BetterHelp is helping them. And I really love that. I love uh, talking about something that works, that helps people, that is a sponsor on the podcast where we talk about mental health. It's very important. Ryan's still with BetterHelp. I'm still with BetterHelp, and it's still helping. helping. It's still still helping. helping. I like hearing that. You know, people don't always realize that physical symptoms like headaches, uh, teeth grinding, even digestive issues can be indicators of stress. And let's not forget about doom scrolling, sleeping too little, sleeping too much, under eating, overeating. Stress shows up in all kinds of ways. And in a world that's telling you to do more, sleep less, and grind all the time, here's your reminder to take care of yourself, to do less, and maybe try some therapy. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. Ryan, you like to see people. I do. I think it helps. I do too. I like to see the person I'm talking to, but that's just me. If you don't feel like seeing a face, you don't have to. You could also text. You could have. You could do whatever you want. Yep. It's so much more affordable than in-person therapy. Trust me on that one. Uh, going to in uh, in-person therapy is, is is so expensive. It's I, I'd say some cases it's triple, quadruple the cost of BetterHelp hmm. by far. Uh, you could be matched with a therapist in under forty-eight hours. Give it a try and see if online therapy can help lower your stress. I believe it really can, truly. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and inside of you listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash inside. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash inside. Give therapy a shot. BetterHelp Online Therapy. Inside of You is brought to you by GEICO. Geico asks, how would you love a chance to save some money on insurance? Well, of course you would. After all, who doesn't love a great deal, right? And when it comes to great rates on insurance for all the things in your life, Geico can help. Like with insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, and RV. Even help with homeowners, condo, or renters coverage. You could save even more with a special discount when you bundle your coverages. Plus, add the easy-to-use GEICO mobile app, available 24-hour roadside assistance, and more. And choosing to switch to GEICO becomes an easy choice. Switch today and see all the ways you could save with great rates and discounts. It's easy. Simply go to GEICO.com to get a rate quote or contact your local agent and get started seeing how much you could save. When was the moment that Gordon would remember, if he were alive, that he would say, this is the moment I think I won Kate over? That, you know, she finally said, hey, he's good to my mom, and he's a nice guy. And how long did it take, and what moment was that that you recall? God, you're getting me talking about all the good stuff. You're very good at your job. <laughs> well, I'm just interested. This I, particular I, job and your acting Oh, job. well, thanks, thanks. Um, another thing I've never really talked about before is I was married before I met Mike. Oh, I didn't know that. And I think the moment Gordon and I healed was I asked Gordon to officiate my first wedding. Wow. And for everything that, because I thought, and still to this day think, and when I said it to him, we had a long, it's one of the most beautiful moments in my memories with Gordon. I said to him, you in the way that you came into our family, represent to me all of the things I want to be in a marriage, which is patient and kind and loving, even when things were hard and holding boundaries, but still 
protecting the people you love and still making room for people's big and uncomfortable feelings. I was so, when I grew up a little bit, I was so grateful and impressed by who Gordon was when I was awful that I wanted him there officiating it. Cause I was like, this is a role model for who I want to be. As I bet he life. cried. I bet he cried. Oh, we cried. He cried. Oh man. Really Gordon. Good. We healed. And I am grateful for that. Cause I never got to have closure with my biological father and Gordon, who unfortunately is gone. And I cannot tell him this either. I was able to heal so much of that through Gordon. Wow. Yeah. That honestly almost brings me to tears. I'm not kidding. I got like, I could feel that, you know, that feeling in the, up here in your chest. And I was like, oh my God, I could just visualize it. And I bet that meant so much to your mom too, that it finally came together where like my daughter accepts Gordon and they're having a moment and this is beautiful. And thank God for this, right? Yeah. Thank God for healing and second chances and forgiveness and like all the beautiful things. Who believed in you? Who, when you said, I'm going out to LA to get shit on. Who said, I really believe in you? Or were, was it just like, let her do this. Let her let it run its course. Yeah. She'll go do this. She'll be back. She'll be a lawyer. She'll do something else. Mm -hmm. I was the second. Everyone always was, um, let Katie be Katie. There was always that feel. Like, Katie, Katie's are going to Katie. So you got to just let Katie do what she's going to do. And that kind of support I had. The people, um, the people who started believing me were people in the profession in L.A. Like um, there's a casting director named Lindsay Shag who gave me my first job. And she, I remember doing an audition for her and she had that face you always want casting directors to have when you're done with an audition. Like, who are you? Where did you come from? Aren't you magic? <laughs> and I had like nothing. And she set me up with reps. I'm like people like that. Every once in a while, I would stumble upon these little magic friends who would believe in me to get me through the next like, six to eight months in the desert between jobs what role was it or what was it that made everyone kind of open their eyes and go our little katie she's got something here i, I don't know she's really doing it <laughs> honestly was it a guest star on something was no, it midnight mass like that's how what? long it's taken <laughs> midnight mass was like the 30th thing you've done I know, but like even after Hill House, they were like, "Oh, that's fun. She does these little horror things." And it wasn't until Midnight Mass that I started hearing from my mom's friends and my mom, where they're like, "You are actually a remarkable actress." What about like, Hush? What? No, nothing from Hush. They thought it was good, but like it wasn't like Katie has a thing going. It was like, "How cute! Katie's still being Katie. She'll be back soon." Wow! Because yeah. when I watched that, I was like, "Oh, who's this?" Who's this? She's playing a, uh, a a deaf writer, or do you say hearing impaired? What am I supposed to say? Deaf. I could say deaf. Deaf community. Deaf is a, a good thing to be. Okay, good, good. I like mm -hmm. that. But um, all right. So you do all these things. You're in L.A. You got a casting director who's kind of like what was her name again? Lindsay Chad. She kind of hooked you up with reps, and you started to get re you got representation from there. Yes. And that was a big thing for you. And then you started going out on auditions and having auditions for the first time. Yes. Yes. And what was the first big thing you can remember getting that was like, I'm going to make some money. I'm going to pay my bills. Oh, I booked, um, I booked an indie film called Steam. Called Stevie? Steam. Like Steam. Steamroller. Steam Steam. Right. And that was with like Ali Sheedy and Ruby G. How was it working with Ali Sheedy? Amazing. She were, was amazing. You weren't starstruck at all? Um, a little bit, but she is a, such a human, like, you know, it takes about what's like when you meet celebrities, how long do you think it, it takes? Like maybe an hour or so before they start just being a person. How long for you? It just depends. I mean, there's been some that I just like, you know, I've worked with Stallone and I'm like hanging with him on set and I'm laughing with him and he's, he knows me by name and we're talking and we're like, you know, we're sitting down at lunch and we're like, you know, it's weeks I've worked with him. I'm still like every once in a while, I'm like. That's Sylvester Stallone. That's, That's yeah, I'm having Sylvester. that with Mark Hamill right now. Like Mark Hamill will never not be. Holy crap! It's Mark Hamill. What you're working with him now? He's an usher. He is, and that's not a yeah. secret. No, 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 no. He's been announced. Wow. Did you get your Star Wars uh, poster sign, or did Mike ask him for an autograph yet? Not yet. We'll get there. 
But like, it's still like, wow. And he's wonderful, talented, humble, kind, generous, everything you want your heroes to be. And a big part. She has a big part. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mark Hamill. Yeah. You know, it's pretty cool. It's like, you know, I think my parents did, were the same way in a, in a sense that they were like, you know, he's going to school. He's going to get over this acting phase. It's going to go away. He's not going to make a living at this. He's going to realize it's too hard like everybody else, and it's going to fade away, and he's going to do something else. And I just kept plugging away because the only person that knows you got it is you. And if you yes. don't know it, you're not going fucking anywhere. And you yeah. just always felt like you had it, didn't you? Yeah. I knew that I had something like I, I had an unquenchable ambition. I was not going to stop. I knew that. And did you have some tough times in LA? The worst. Like what? Yeah, the worst times I had, I was in a play reading class and the plays were $7 and I couldn't afford a play. I had, um, doing, like the worst type of jobs. Like there was a job that I did for a while where I was um, a promo girl at clubs where like you're handing out shots to people who grope you and touch you and awful, but I, ha I had to pay rent. I wasn't booking work. I had um, long, long stretches where I couldn't get a job and people were actively telling me I was bad at acting. I had- People told you you were bad. Oh, I've lost a manager because I was bad. I've never had anybody say you're bad. You're oh, a bad is, actor. I can't Kate story. And I'm going to drop the fucking name because fuck her. Fuck her. This one's for you. <laughs> what, tell me. So was a family friend. And I got not like, like when I say family, like Flana family, like within the intrepid world. Okay. I had a meeting with and she agreed to represent me. This was after Hush, but before Hill House. And we did a pilot season together. And one of the pilots I went out for was the Nancy Drew pilot. And I have never been great at solving network TV scenes. The like, ba bump bump joke, big bang theory, things like that. I can't quite get it. I coached hard on that audition. It was not, I was not great. Okay. And I was nervous and things like that. And after that audition, before I think this was even, God, was it before Hush premiered, maybe? Um, she'd seen it, but I don't remember if it had gone to South by yet. She got on the phone with me and she was like, the feedback is so bad. I don't think you're cut out for this. I took you on as a favor so I could get closer to Mike. And I don't just don't think this is going to work out. What? And she said, I, was, I did this as a favor to get closer to Mike, your now husband. Mm -hmm. Who has the audacity to, to even say that? Mike and Trevor and do all of those things. Yeah. And what was your response? Did you, did you break down and cry? Obviously. I think what I said, and I'm like, still like I have such compassion for me. I think what I said was, I'm so sorry. Oh like, I'm sorry God. it wasn't good. I'm sorry I disappointed you. I'm sorry I couldn't do better. And I was just absolutely devastated. And even now, like, I feel a little embarrassed for having said her name. Right. But, like, she said those things to me, and I don't think that's okay. Like, she could have easily just dropped me and been like, hey, pilot season isn't working out. I'm going in a different direction. A she million percent. Just, yeah. She I, I agree with you. I was bad. She did not need to tell me that she just did it as a favor. Let me tell you, as much as I hate it, it's a necessity that, you know, you, we have managers and agents and things like that, but their, their job is to sort of help you and guide you and give you the confidence and make you better and, and believe in you. And you're going to have bad days and you're going to have bad moments. And as much as I'd like them to be, just be brutally honest. You can't tell me that every casting director likes me. You can't tell me that every audition I have, I'm great. And they're just going in a different direction. I want to hear the real truth. We don't as actors, we'll fall apart. We don't want to hear, first of all, we could hear some lot of the truth, some of the truth. We could hear, hey, you know what, Michael, uh, Rosie, you know, you just, that you didn't do well in that audition. You just, yeah. you, you, you didn't do you well. You nervous. weren't good. Were you nervous in that audition? It didn't work. Like, what do you think happened there? Right? That's a yes. collaborative. But thing. to say you're bad. Yeah. Yeah. 
like I've had managers be like, I feel like you're coming across. It's like a little bit too perfect, like type A, like it has to be right. You have to relax a bit, like guiding somebody, but to just, just kneecap me. Mm, hurt. It hurts so much. There's so many stories I'm telling on this podcast. I've never told. Them. I like it. I think it just, it just, it's grounding. It's also like people who don't know the business, the, the world that we live in. We can see how cruel it can be. And we can see like your life. You're telling me about your stepdad and your, how your, your, you know, your father passed away on the tennis court just so abruptly. And it's like, these are things that happen to people. And I just think it's, it's just people could relate. Some people out there are like, holy shit. Like you've, you've lived a life and you've worked really hard, but you've also had your fucking downs. Yeah. And I think it's important too. I think, what I do on set as Aaron, as Theo, as the character I'm playing now, it is intimate and it is for you guys. It's not for me. I would love to just stay home, play with my kids <laughs> and, and do Shakespeare with my friends. But I do it because I think authenticity of life is important. And I think intimacy is important. And I think people being vulnerable is important. And this started happening around the time of Hush is that I developed a fan base that was girls like 16 to 25. And I want them to know that I'm a person who struggles, who has to do things, who had depressive episodes, who kept going. Like, this is for them to say, if you're looking at me as some kind of icon, you're missing, like, the piles of corpses of my past selves that I'm standing on top of. And that whoever you are today is okay. Because who I was when I was screaming, you opportunistic fuck, at my <laughs> stepdad, she was okay, too. Wow. We were doing our best, eh? Yeah. I, I think so. That's all you could do. I mean, Does that sound too Pollyanna? Did I just sound no, like fuck no, loser? absolutely. I don't think so. Ryan, do you think so? Ryan's over there. Ryan, am I a loser? No, you, these stories are great. <laughs> he's like going, whoa, oh, he's like in awe. Like this is this is good. This is right. this is what people want to hear. They don't want to hear just boring. Like I'm an actor and you're an actor. Let's talk about meeting celebrities and hanging out. What do, yeah, what do normal people talk about? No, this is what you you'd be surprised. I've had guests talk about trying to kill themselves. I've had guests talk about, you know, their mom and mental illness and crying on on the podcast, all sorts of shit. Like it's like uh it's an open forum, you know. It's really just like it's like kind of whatever happens. But like back to you, do you you know, I try to think of like people say, you know, have you found yourself? Do you know who you are now? Do you know what your purpose is? And I'm like going, I don't I don't know. I really don't fucking know. I, I wonder if I'll ever know. I wonder if I'll be 90 years old and go, who are you? But do you feel like you've gone through this stage where, like, when you came out to L.A., was there a level of confusion with who you were and what you wanted? And, like, you just, like, you, you what were you going through, like, living out here trying to make ends meet? Um, I think it's a pretty common story. I was going through, like, drinking and drugs and random gig jobs and hanging out with actors and going to acting class. And, like you said, having no idea who I was. And um, like covering up my deep well of uncertainty with alcohol and cigarettes. And Did you smoke a lot and drink a lot? Oh my God, the most. And drugs and drinking and smoking. And what kind of like, drugs? I mean, you just, you snorted, you powdered your nose? Yeah, I would, um, let's see, I've done, oh God, am I, I can't get arrested for things I did in the no, past. No, people right? don't. I talked, I've done cocaine, I've done pot. Yeah, I mean, I've done, I've done everything except for heroin good, and heroin adjacent things. But I've done like, oh, I haven't done acid, but I've done mushrooms. I don't trust I acid. Go. I won't do it. I won't do acid. I don't I, trust that. I won't that. do acid. My brain doesn't like it. Uh, yeah, I'll melt. Um, I've done pills. I've done, mm -hmm. yeah. I've done what you've done. Yeah, we like, like, but I, I somehow, the only one that's that stuck was alcohol. It, it stuck as in you still do it? No, as in I had to <laughs> literally quit it. Like I had to get sober. The rest wow. of them, I kind of could take or leave and I dabbled in Coke and then left Coke. And but some people dabble in Coke and they can't fucking let go. Yeah. But for me, I, I, alcohol just pickled my brain and I had to leave. 
I had to leave the party. Was it something that you were like, wow, I need a drink. I need a drink in the morning. I need a drink in the afternoon. I want to have four glasses of wine. It just felt like it was consuming you. Yeah, I was a fucking alcoholic. I am an alcoholic. Wow. And so you went yeah. through the 12 step program and all that stuff? Well, I'm in the middle of steps right now. And let me tell you, that's not fun. But um, yeah, I have a meeting and a sponsor and all that. Talk about coming clean and being honest with yourself and just like, that's got to be fucking hard though. Like to really tell the truth. Like we could sit here and tell people all day the things that we think they want to hear or, or sugarcoat it. But when you get into these kind of positions where you're in a 12 step, it, you're just hurting yourself if you're not honest. Yes. You're just fucking yourself essentially. Yeah. Um, my favorite thing about getting sober is that I stopped lying. And I wasn't like a big liar. Like I wasn't, but like my whole life I had told tiny lies. Like, oh, I owned a horse when I was a kid. I fucking did not own a horse when I was a kid. Things like that. Things that like completely arbitrary lies for no reason whatsoever. Just a fucking liar. And I would constantly get caught in them because I forget that I lied about it. So, so much of my mental energy was like, who did I lie to about what? And if I tell the story, will this, do? and now I just don't do it anymore. And like, it leads to some awkward moments in the moment, but I never have to keep my story straight. Right. Jesus. I like that a lot. I it's have a horse. Story. You don't have a horse. Why would you lie about having a horse? Well, it's such a weird thing. Well, you can see it, right? I want it to be considered like special and rich and somehow like, like, I don't know, high class and things like that. I want it to be fancy. Yeah, I can understand that. And so like you get, like, it's sort of sad, right? Like, it's not, no one, no one looks at that lie and is like, what a monster. They're just like, ugh. Yeah, it's a little white lie. I had a horse. Yeah. Like, it's like, I, you know, my mom, you know, my family, we have a, we have a Porsche. But we don't, yeah. we don't have a Porsche. But we it just feels good that if I did have a Porsche as a kid, you know. Yeah. Tell your friends. Well, it'd be cool, right? Yeah, you, well, you think you'd be cool, but then you get older and you're like, <laughs> it doesn't. It yeah, doesn't mean Porsches cool. aren't cool. Uh, do you have trouble watching yourself? Mm -mm. You don't mind watching a movie with you in it or your TV show. You're fine with it. I like it. You like it. I never, I rarely hear that. Most really? people, yeah, most people are just like, yeah, I just don't. You know, I'm okay. Sometimes I'll be like, okay, you were good in that. Okay. But sometimes I'm really hard on myself. So it's it's tough, but you but you enjoy it. Yeah, I'm always hard on myself, so that's not going to change. Like, it's not like I, I leave a scene and I feel great, and then I watch the scene and I feel terrible. I always think that I shit the bed. So when I watch it, I get two things. One is a little perspective, and I can be like, oh, my God, look, it's me. I'm on TV just like I want it to be. <laughs> or, oh, my God, look at her. Look at little Katie Siegelbaum going and doing it. Siegelbaum. That's her real Isn't name. so funny? Little Katie Siegelbaum <laughs> with tiny teeth. Like, I love her Baby so much. teeth and big gums. And the biggest gums. I got to see a picture of this. You have to, send, you have to text me. You have to text me. I think there's some on my Insta. Like, I have a couple out there. Oh, you do? And yeah. I mean, I did steam the entire movie. I had old, the old teeth. And a bunch of things. And Castle, I did the old teeth. Anyway, um, so I have that. And the second is, oh, it's not as bad as I thought. I did a pretty good job in acting. And so it feels nice. It's also nice when you trust the people you're working with. You trust the director. You trust the DP. You trust the other actors. You're like, hey, that's a nice place to be. Yeah. Although I did um, an episode of Hawaii Five O, and you talk about those days, which I love. I loved. I had a great time on Hawaii Five O with RoboCop, who directed me. Really? Uh -huh. and, what, what's uh, his name? Peter. 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 Well, Peter Weller. Peter Weller, yes. And he was wonderful, wonderful director. And that was one of those days you were talking about. Like that whole time in Hawaii, I left set every day like, fuck yeah. Uh, drop the mic, living my best life, covered in blood, doing shit, like at a bar, doing a big scene. And I watched it and I loved it. Like that just start to finish was like that. Because I didn't know those people from it. I didn't know Scott Kahn. I didn't know Peter Weller. That was an offer. I didn't have to audition for it. It was right after Theo Crane. And um, I kind of threw caution entirely into the wind. And I was like, I don't know. Maybe this will suck. I don't know. It was always sucked on Hawaii 5.0. Wouldn't be the first person. <laughs> what, what's the, the most favorite 
your favorite thing you've ever done? What's the, you look at it, you go, this was the best thing I've ever done. Like if hush. I want somebody, hush, see, that's what hush. I thought. I mean, yeah. I, don't, I don't think that's the best. I think it's like one of the best, but I mean, Haunting of Hill House, Midnight Mass. I mean, all these, these are all great. What was the- hush for me, I wrote it with Mike. It was the accumulation of 30 years of my life that I poured into that person day by day. I would get up in the morning and run before set. I left set every day feeling I had left everything I had on the field. I was so happy. The level of happy I was maybe mirrors only the birth of my children in terms of like, and my wedding day, in terms of just like, but that was 18 days, six days a week, night shoots every night, like a no money, no nothing, skin of our teeth film. And, oh, I have my old teeth in Hush. You did? Mm-hmm. Your teeth weren't bad. I, I would have I would have said, man, that girl's got some crazy grill. But I didn't say I, that. Yeah, my old teeth are in Hush. I didn't notice um, they were bad. <laughs> I think you're just too hard on yourself. Oh, man, yeah. Just put that on a T-shirt for me. I should tattoo them. It's like, that's like, if I had a business card, it would say Kate Siegel, too hard on herself. Yeah. yeah. I think we're all like that. I think a lot of people are. Yeah. I think I think it's, it's just one of the things as I get older, I'm just like, stop. Just be good to yourself. How do you I stop? know. What I, do you do? It's what like do you, 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 you fucked up. You fucked up. It's okay. Try not to do it again. You did it again. <laughs> you got to change your ways, dude, but don't hate yourself for it. You've got some kind of shit going on. Why do you repeat these bad things that you do? You know, and just because it's not going to help you just shitting on yourself. It's just going to bring you even lower. So, you know, and if you need help, you get help. You get, I go to therapy. I fucking talk to someone. I go, I keep doing these things. I don't, I don't know why I keep doing that. I'm like, well, how do we stop that? And then you get help from someone who knows what the fuck they're talking about. And like, you make changes. But yeah. I don't know. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. All right, this is called Shit Talking with Kate Siegel. These are my patrons who they just give extra to the podcast. They're amazing. Go to patreon.com. You guys are amazing. Thank you for your support. They they love you. They, they're they just so supportive of the podcast. And this is rapid fire. So you could just answer these or you could say, I don't want to answer them. Here we go. Okay. Little Lisa, what's the weirdest thing on your bucket list? Um, the weirdest thing in my bucket list. Getting a horse. Eat a live octopus. A live octopus. Like old boy. Remember in the Korean film, old boy, and he eats in his fucking fish over his face. Oh, my God. That's the weirdest thing in your bucket list. That's the weirdest thing. On my All right. List. I like it. I dig. Michelle K. Yes. Can you ask if she actually believes in ghosts or had a supernatural encounter? Um, I believe that there is more. What is it? There's more in heaven and earth ratio than is dreamt of in your philosophy. I, there is room in my belief for ghosts. I... I occasionally feel like my dad is around, yeah. Nice. I think that's a good feeling. By the way, does Mike believe in ghosts? I didn't ask no. him that. He doesn't at all. No. He doesn't believe and in I supernatural know. shit. Science, science, science. I and believe. a sense of compassion for the universe. I, I believe in the supernatural. You believe in ghosts? Have you seen a ghost? I, I, I think that there's trauma sometimes in certain places where someone's killed or someone dies and there's an energy there's an energy about that um i don't know we don't need to get into that but i mean I, there's... that nothing is either created or destroyed in the entirety of the universe so yeah who's to say right who is to say emily s was there a moment any moment on haunting a haunting of hill house that really freaked you out yeah i mean episode eight in the car Risa and i are driving victoria pedretti she at pedretti jumps in half a page early on that scene. And that's the take you see in the show. That's a legitimate response from me and Risa. We were not expecting it. I was scared as fuck. Wow. Yeah. That was freaky as shit. Yeah. She did really good. Yeah. That show was great. Tall man freaked me out. He's so scary. He was so scary. Is, is tall man. Was he uh, was that a real person? I know obviously there was CGI, but was there. He's a tall person. But yeah, he was on stilts, I believe, or, or was um, lifted up on something. Right. I never worked with Tall Man, so I actually don't know the answer to that. You don't know the answer. But I'm assuming. All right. You know. Meg K, Midnight Mass is one of the first shows to go back into production at the height of the pandemic. What was that experience like? Through hindsight, it was special and unique and camaraderie building. At the time, we were as terrified as everybody else. And it created this um, community feeling in the show 
that you see on screen, that, that we were isolated and we only had each other because that was true. How depressing was the weather there? Or is it just constantly just shit and gray and rain and depression? I don't know. Vancouver, um, so I went to school in Syracuse, which is the actual armpit of the nation. It snows and is gray and rainy from October until May. So anything is an improvement to Syracuse. And Vancouver has the most beautiful spring and summer of anywhere I've ever been. And so the winters are hard, I'm not going to lie. But... I don't know, production time is different than real world time because you're shooting nights and so you're sleeping during the day and you need those nighttime hours. And yeah, it was rainy out in the farm, but like we needed that rain for work. Like the weather was a part of our lives. Yeah. And yeah. so it's different than this winter where I was just sitting around where it was harder. I really got emotional in Midnight Mass when Robert Longstreet's, uh, what was his character's name? Uh, Joe Colley. Joe Colley's dog dies. Oh my God, he was so beautiful. Oh my scene. God, right? I he just was so proud of him. I was so proud of him. I was just like, there oh my God. There was even a full puppet. There was half of a dog and a puppet master with his arm up that dog. That is what Robert is acting with in that scene. It was, and every single actor and extra is staring at him while he does it, plus the crew and the camera. I, it, the amount of pressure on him in that moment, because we didn't have a dog. The dog puppet was only half a puppet. He is surrounded by effects people. Everyone is staring at him. And he was able to create that performance in that moment. I thought it was exquisite. Oh, Raj says, what's your method for showing fear or terror for a scene? Good direction on set, recalling a memory when you were scared, some combination. Um, breath work. Get your breath in the right place and the rest will do it for you. So when you're scared... <laughs> You can do it before action. You can do it during the scene. But for any of that stuff, for me, it always starts with the breath. Have you ever almost passed out from just breathing too heavy, heavily? 100% of the time, yes. I know. I've done that before. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm getting lightheaded. I'm going to pass out. <gasps> oh, my God. And then I hear. Uh, don't, they better not call cut until I actually fucking pass out because I'm giving them gold. gold <laughs> is that what it is? You can get that like that like spotted hive look on the skin you get when you're hyperventilating. That's worth its weight in special effects money. Yeah. Where are you now? Are you in LA? I'm in Vancouver. You're in Vancouver. Oh, you, everything's yeah. in Vancouver. The next, this is everything. in Vancouver. Everything. Yeah, shooting in Vancouver. Well, what's next for you? I know you got this. You've got a lot of work left to do in this, but do you, you know what's next for you? I have a lot of work left, left to do in this. Um, Time Traveler's Wife comes out uh, in the spring, which is going to be a total 180 from what you've seen me do in the past. It's so fun. What are you doing? What can we expect? Or um, is so it if you've read the book, no. Um, it's about a time traveler right. and his girlfriend in time. And I play <laughs> his mother, who in the book is kind of sort of just a side character. She dies and it affects this little boy his whole life. But Stephen Moffat took that character and made this incredible woman out of her, as Stephen Moffat does. And then he entrusted that with me. And she's just this truly glamorous glittery 1980s famous opera singer wow are you a good singer no can you not sing at all not even i know would you ever sing in a movie or a show nope i'll be dubbed though i'll lip sync all day really you can't sing you look like somebody that could sing i can like sing to a lullaby to my kids right sure but like there was that did you get a call for the um the remake or whatever, the Wicked something. There's like a new Disney musical TV mm. show they're doing. No. New Sleeping Beauty or something. And they're like, hey, Kate, all you got to do is put a little song on tape. And I said to my reps, I was like, I'm not going to do this, not because I don't think I could pull off one song for an audition, but because God help me if I book this job and I show up and it's like Josh Gad and like Kristen Bell and me trying to figure out does that what terrify you? Does that just you? terrify you? Yeah, I, I just got the like hot feeling. Who do you want to work with? If you could work with one director right now out there, obviously other than Mike, who would it be? Like, let's talk big directors. I'm trying to narrow it down. Actually, what I'm honestly trying to do is think of someone who's not a white male. Um, <laughs> but I don't really have that. So Steven Soderbergh. I Steven love Soderbergh. Soderbergh does. It's always weird. It's always sort of out there. 
and um, like he'll shoot an entire movie on his iPhone or he makes a movie about a call girl in a time where nobody was allowing sex work to be anything other than a fault. Um, I really love him. I love the Coen brothers. They're also doing crazy stuff. I would love to dip my toe in comedy in that way, that particular brand of dark comedy. Yeah. Um, Shonda Rhimes is on my bucket list. I think she, like Mike, is a genre creator. Like when you know, you know exactly what a Shonda Rhimes show is in terms of like glamour and sparkle and like wit. Uh, you know, someone asked me if I would do nudity and I think I would. If it was the you right, I, th I think I would. If it was just the right director, it was the right piece. If it just seemed like, you know, this is part of it. It's not like jackass where I'm like nailing my balls to the fucking floor. You know what I mean? But, yeah. uh, <laughs> yeah. but I think I would do, would you, would you do nudity? The only time I would is, um, did you ever see, you know, before sunrise, then they have that after sunset and this minute and Julie Delpy does that whole argument topless. Yes. That I, something like that. Because to me, it was completely necessary because that was completely truthful in the moment. Because when you're in that relationship, you're not putting a shirt on to fight with someone. Yeah. And so it was something like that. I don't, I never do. I won't do. I'll let them simulate it with a double, but I don't do sex. I don't do kissing. I don't do, I don't do it. You don't do Ever kissing? Wait, 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 wait. What? I won't do it. Wait, you won't do I'll kissing? Well, yeah, I'll do, I did kissing. The last time I did kissing was in Hill House. And otherwise I'll fake it. Like you can fake it with camera angles or they can kiss your neck or they can do that. But I don't like to do mouth to mouth kissing. Really? That, I mean, that's something that I did, I learned today. Because no kissing, I, I, no nudity. If you're going to simulate sex, it has to be someone else. Wow. Have you ever been offered something and you turn it down because of that? No, generally people work around it because you can't, that's the whole point. You can work around it. If the, and, and listen, if the kiss is extremely important and I'm like, this is great. We need this moment for whatever it is. But if it is the two people are about to have sex, I'm like, he can kiss my neck. He can grab me and we can be face to face. I don't need to French somebody to start a sex scene. I don't. And I don't. For me, it's a hard boundary. Mm -hmm. Wow, I, I appreciate that. You stick to your guns. I try, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I've had to kiss. Um, you like it? I have. Sometimes I have not liked it. Like, I wish that we didn't have to kiss. And then there's been some times where I'm like, well, this didn't suck. You know, the yeah. person's breath was nice. It was yeah, uh, sensual. We are both respect each other. Uh, didn't suck. But there's Dang other times. <laughs> but there's other times where I'm like, oh man, I yeah. did not look forward to this. But this is this is part of the job. I love this conversation. I love talking to you. I had such a good time talking to you. Yeah, we ha yeah. I want to hang out with you guys sometime. We have to all hang you out. You are totally welcome to hang out with us. Come up to Vancouver, or when we come back to LA, we would love to hang out. I would love it. Invite uh, Rob and myself. We'll we'll uh, yes. we'll come over and and just wait until you talk to Rahul. It's going to be. Like Rahul is one of the funnest interviews I've ever seen. Really? Ever I could talk to him about anything? Anything. Nothing is off limits. He is insightful and vulnerable and honest and funny. You're going to have a great time. I can't wait. This has yeah. been a real treat. Thank you for doing this. Thanks for having me. Yes, you're awesome. Keep up the great work. I look forward to seeing everything you freaking do. Yay. Hashtag no kissing. All right. No kissing. Maybe on the neck. On the neck. On the neck. On the neck only. <laughs> All right. I'll see you later. Bye. Bye. Yeah, she was. Uh, she was fun. I, I, you know, it's 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 nice to see when an, another actor talks about their nerves and how, you know, when they're first on set and they're, you know, they want to be great. It's you want to be great. It's that yearning for it to be, you know, just impressed to to be. We all have it. And I think she, she just has that. She wants to be good. She wants to come through. She wants to do her job. And she talks about those insecurities. And uh, I've felt those insecurities uh, insecurities before. It's always nice, Ryan, when you when you learn from your guests or you can. Yeah. Uh, uh, what's the word when you could uh, relate? Relate. Relate <laughs> is the word. <laughs> Guys, thanks for listening to the podcast today. Please subscribe. If you like this interview, please uh, subscribe, write a review. It helps the podcast substantially. There's so many podcasts 
Uh, that's all I ask of you. That's it. Uh, check out the uh, Inside You online store for awesome merch. Also, the Sunspin, my band. We have a website, sunspin.com. You can book uh, Zooms with me. You can buy cool merch. Um, there's that. I'll be in the St. Louis at the uh, Fan X St. Louis mm. Fan Expo. That's mm. uh, May 13th, 14th, and 15th. At May 13th, we're doing a, a Smallville Nights. That's an improv show with me and Welling. And then I'll be in Liverpool later that month. And uh, thanks, my patrons, my lovable patrons for my lovable p- 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 patrons for joining Patreon and uh, giving back to the podcast. You really keep the podcast afloat, and I couldn't do it without you. And I want to say thank you, Ryan. I love having him here. He's my main man, thick and thin. Bryce, thanks for uh, working so hard on this podcast. Jason, my editor, you're rocking it. Um, and everybody at Westwood One Cumulus, uh, thanks for all the the love and the support and all my friends. And I just want to say continue on, rock on. Uh, I appreciate you. And right now, why don't we just read the top tiers? Let's do it. These are the top tier patrons. Here we go. Can we have some music, Jason? <laughs> that might add something to it. Just like some sports, maybe, some maybe sports J- center music, Jason's like highlights. Either, yeah, Jason's either added music right now underneath slowly or nothing. So, Jason, we'll see what you do. We'll find maybe, out. Maybe you'll just cut out what I'm saying right now. Here we go. Nancy D. Leah S. I did the old lick. <clears throat> Nancy D. Leah S. Sarah V. Little Lisa. Yukiko. Jill E. Brian H. Nico P. Robert B. Jason W. Kristen. K. Allison L. Raj C. Joshua D. CJ. P. Jennifer N. Stacy L. Jen S. Jamal F. Janelle B. Kimberly E. Mike E. L. Don Supremo. 99 more. Ramira. Santiago M. Chad W. Leanne P. Janine R. Maya P. Maddie S. Belinda N. Chris H. Dave. Uh, e. H. 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 Spider Man. J. Sheila. G. Brad. D. Ray. Ray. H. Tabitha. T. Tom N. Liliana A. Talia M. <laughs> Betsy. Uh, God. Betsy D. That's correct, my uh, friend. Chad L. Rochelle Marion. Uh, Meg K. Trav L. Dan N. Big Stevie W. Angel M. Rhiannon C. Corey K. Super Sam. Deb Nixon. Michelle A. Jeremy C. Andy T. Cody R. Gavinator. David C. John B. Brandy D. Yavor. Camille S. The C. Joey M. Willie F. We're getting to the nitty gritty here. David H. I think that's David Hall. Hey, Dave oh. Hall. Hey, Dave Hall. How you doing, brother? Uh, Adelaide N, Omar I. What if I just did that voice? Lena N, Design OTG, Eugene and Leah, Chris P, Nikki G, Corey, Nicole, Patricia, Heather L, Jake B, James B, Bob it, Abel F, Joshua B, Tony G, <laughs> Megan T, Mel S, Orlando C, John B, Caroline R, Rob E, Paul C, Christine S, Sarah S, Eric H, Spring. Spring is here. And Jennifer R. I really couldn't do this show without you, top tier patrons and all patrons. Thank you. Thank you for all the support. And I'm fine. I think I, I posted on something on Patreon that, you know, I sent a message that, you know, I was a little under and uh, I came back from Mexico, which I had a great time. But uh, I think I was dehydrated because for one day I had no energy and I felt maybe a tad nauseous and I was a little achy. And so I got a PCR COVID immediately. I'm negative, And then it was gone 24 hours. Isn't it amazing that a lot of the things that ail us can be cured with hydration? That's so true. I'm Isn't gonna... it frustrating? I'm going to drink <laughs> but... some water right now. That's why. Um, oh, this is nice. We'll just get some uh, ASMR. Yeah. What's that right. stand for? It stands for doing things into the microphone like this. <sighs> I don't know what it stands for. I, don't know what it stands for. I just know what it is. Guys, thank you for choosing this podcast once again. Thanks for uh, all the support and all the love. Um, join me next week. We have another great guest. And uh, yeah, all I have to say is thank you from uh, myself, Michael Rosenbaum. From myself, Ryan Diaz. Hey, I'm the Hollywood Hill in California. <laughs> You're right there? Yeah, I don't know. I'm just indigestion. Guys, be good to yourself. Most importantly, Have a great week, and uh, seriously, thanks for listening. Hopefully, you'll uh, join us next week, and uh, I'll talk to you soon.